So first, let's start by talking about what pulmonary emboli are, what substances form them. In fact, most of the time when we talk about pulmonary emboli, we're thinking about thrombus or blood clot. But pulmonary emboli can also result from amniotic fluid and fat. Also, air can embolize lodging in pulmonary circulation. So any of these substances will essentially start in the lower circulation, travel through the venous system, through the right side of the heart, and into the pulmonary circulation. In 1860, Virchow identified three conditions that increase the risk of thrombosis or blood clot. What is Virchow's triad? Venous stasis, endothelial injury, and a hypercoagulable state are the three things that compose Virchow's triad. When these th three things are present at the same time, it increases your patient's risk of forming blood clots or thrombosis. DVT, or deep venous thrombosis, can become pulmonary emboli. When blood clots form in the large vessels, large veins of the lower extremities or pelvis, they can dislodge to become emboli, traveling through the venous system, traveling through the right side of the heart, and then lodging in the pulmonary circulation. This leads to several consequences. When the pulmonary circulation is blocked, gas exchange is blocked. Remember, it's the interface between the pulmonary capillaries and the alveoli where oxygen comes into the blood and carbon dioxide is eliminated. Emboli blocking this perfusion will also block that gas exchange. So depending upon the burden of clot that lodges within the pulmonary circulation, that will determine the extent of gas exchange disturbances. There will be a disturbance in oxygen going into the pulmonary capillaries, so your patient will become hypoxemic. You can detect this using a pulse oximeter with a low SpO2. Similarly, because carbon dioxide is not delivered to the alveoli because the perfusion is blocked, if you're using an entitled CO2 monitor, you will have a low level of carbon dioxide being exhaled. Do pulmonary emboli increase shunt or do they increase dead space? Pulmonary emboli increase dead space. Remember, dead space is any volume of air that is inhaled but does not participate in gas exchange. In the case of pulmonary emboli, the area is ventilated, but it's not perfused. Ventilation is designated as capital letter V, and perfusion is designated as capital letter Q. So in the case of dead space, ventilation exceeds perfusion, or V is greater than Q. Dead space is an example of V-Q mismatch. We do have physiologic or anatomic reasons to have dead space. Our airways, including the trachea, the bronchi, and the bronchioles that move air but do not contain alveoli for gas exchange are anatomic or physiologic areas of dead space. Pathologic areas of dead space include pulmonary emboli where the perfusion to alveoli are blocked. Virchow stated that you need venous stasis, endothelial injury, and a hypercoagulable state. When looking at increased risk factors for thrombosis or a hypercoagulable state, factors can be either hereditary or acquired. We have endogenous anticoagulants, including protein C, protein S, and antithrombin. Deficiencies in any of these three anticoagulants can lead to a prothrombotic or hypercoagulable state. Factor V Leiden is actually a resistance to protein C, so results in the same hypercoagulable state. A gene mutation in prothrombin can also be prothrombotic or hypercoagulable. And elevated levels of homocysteine, hyperhomocysteinemia, can also lead to a prothrombotic or hypercoagulable state. The mechanism of hyperhomocysteinemia is less well understood. 
Lupus anticoagulant actually describes antibodies to phospholipids on cell membranes. It's a misnomer to call it lupus anticoagulant because, in fact, it results in a prothrombotic state. Moving on to the acquired conditions or risk factors for increased thrombosis, immobility, recent surgery, malignancy, prior DVT or pulmonary emboli, central venous catheters, trauma, pregnancy, and exogenous estrogen are all acquired factors that can lead to an increased risk of thrombosis formation. We mentioned that fat can also embolize, and why does this happen? Fat embolism occurs in 90% of major trauma. It also occurs in femur surgery, long bone fractures, burns, and can occur with TPN administration. Fat is stored in subcutaneous tissue, but also in bone marrow, which explains why these fat uh, molecules and particles can dislodge. Despite 90% of major trauma patients having fat embolism, only a small amount develop what's called fat embolism syndrome, which is clinically significant. And in fact, it's 2-5% to of fat emboli patients. It occurs 12-36 to hours after a major injury and has mortality up to 20%. The syndrome consists of shortness of breath and hypoxia, a petechial rash, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, anemia, and altered mental status. We also mentioned that amniotic fluid can embolize. Why does this occur? During the last stages of labor, during cesarean section, during elective abortion, and especially during induced labor, amniotic fluid can enter the venous system. From there, it will embolize towards the pulmonary circulation. This can lead to a severe clinical syndrome, including cardiovascular collapse and DIC because of the inflammatory response and lack of perfusion. Air can also embolize. If you have an IV line that's not primed and has air in it, that air can be injected into the venous system. Similarly, this can happen with dialysis lines, peripheral IVs, and central lines. Anytime the venous system's pressure is negative or less than atmospheric, air can actually be aspirated into the veins. This can happen during sitting neurosurgical procedures. It can also happen during central line placement if the insertion site is not below the heart. High-pressure mechanical ventilation can also force air into the venous system, leading to embolism. And I'm sure most of you have heard that you can have air enter both the venous and arterial system during too rapid an ascent while scuba diving. Air embolism leads to the same clinical consequences as other types of emboli. You'll have hypoxemia, but air is also very inflammatory, so you can also have DIC and other inflammatory consequences. Guys, thank you very much for watching. Uh, Make sure that you like, subscribe, and share this video. Like it if you like it. If you don't like it, then don't like it. And then uh, subscribe if you want more videos. We upload videos regularly. So if you subscribe to the channel, you can get a notification and the video will appear in your inbox. And if you hit the uh, bell button as well, then you can get the notifications for this as well.